Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Mechanics Institute online program featuring Sacred Mountains of the World with author Edwin Birnbaum, who will be in conversation with Phil Cosano, who's the author of The Art of Pilgrimage. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. And if you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we are one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the, in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, our international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please see us at milibrary.org and also visit our website and come down in person at 57 Post Street in San Francisco. So in this time of political strife and pandemic, we offer you a respite. <laughs> Tonight we're going to celebrate two new editions of books that will both inspire you and also that are very aspirational. Um, first of all, Edwin Birnbaum's second edition of Sacred Mountains of the World uh, takes the reader on a fascinating journey exploring the role of mountains in the mythologies, religions, history, literature, and art of cultures around the world. And Phil Cosano, author of another ex examination of sacred sites in his The Art of Pilgrimage, The Seeker's Guide to Making Travel Sacred, gives us remarkable stories from famous travelers, poets, and modern day pilgrims. And it's also in its second edition and it's a wonderful guide for the mindful traveler who's longing for something more than just diversion or escape. So I'd like to give you a little more detail about their biographies uh, before we begin. Uh, Dr. Birnbaum is a mountain, mountain, mountaineer and a scholar of comparative religion and mythology whose work focuses on the relationship between culture and nature. The first edition of Sacred Mountains of the World won the Commonwealth Club of California's gold medal for nonfiction and the Italian award for literature of mountaineering, exploration and the environment. He is also the author of The Way to Shambhala, a study of Tibetan myths of hidden sanctuaries resembling the fictional Shangri-La of Lost Horizon. He initiated and directed a program working with the national parks, such as Yosemite and Hawaii volcanoes, to develop interpretive materials based on the evocative cultural and spiritual significance of mountain environments on the cultures around the world. And he was also featured in the film Beyond the Mountaintops, Extraordinary Mountaineers, Extraordinary People. Actually, that was a, a museum exhibition, not a film. And Phil Cosano is an award-winning writer and filmmaker, teacher and editor, lecturer, storyteller, and TV host. With more than 35 books translated into more than 10 languages and script writing credits to his name. Cosano has also appeared alongside mentors such as Joseph Campbell and Houston Smith. He was host and co-writer of Global Spirit which is on PBS TV. And he's also appeared on CNN, the Discovery Channel, the Smithsonian Channel, and interviewed for many publications. Also, we're so pleased to welcome him back because we featured many author events with him uh, for his book, uh, books such as The Word Catcher, uh, Burning the Midnight Oil, and several other uh, wonderful events, and so we're we're so pleased to welcome you back, even though we're here virtually. And we hope to welcome both of you uh, to Mechanics Institute live in person very soon. So please welcome uh, Edwin Birnbaum and Phil Cosmo. Well, thank you very much, Laura, for the introduction for both of us, and uh, thanks also to the Mechanics Institute for hosting this. This is my first time, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my book on Sacred Mountains of the World 
uh, basically looks at the incredible range and diversity of the ways in which mountains are sacred to people all around the world, not only in traditional cultures, but also in modern cultures. And to give a sort of an overview of the book and how it works, uh, the introduction deals with the experience of the sacred and how mountains have a powerful way of evoking the sacred in various ways. And then the first part of the book is called Mount Sacred Mountains Around the World. And it basically deals with mountains on every continent except Antarctica, because in Antarctica there aren't permanent residents and we need people for whom mountains are sacred for them to be sacred in the usual sense. It deals with uh, these mountains around the world. And uh, let me give you uh, a sense of uh, how the book works, uh, reading a few passages. For the introduction, this is the way the book opens, the first paragraph. As the highest and most dramatic features of the natural landscape, mountains have an extraordinary power to evoke the sacred. The ethereal rise of a rigid mist, the glint of moonlight on an icy face, a flare of gold on a distant peak. Such glimpses of transcendent beauty can reveal our world as a place of unimaginable mystery and splendor. In the fierce play of natural elements that swirl about their summits, thunder, lightning, wind, and clouds, mountains also embody powerful forces beyond our control, physical expressions of an awesome reality that can overwhelm us with feelings of wonder and fear. And then this is how the mountains uh, go on to look at how mountains basically um, function in different cultures. So another passage. Uh, from the introduction, because of their power to awaken an overwhelming sense of the sacred, mountains have come to be associated with the highest and most central values and aspirations of religions and cultures throughout the world. Mount Sinai occupies a special place as the awesome site where God appeared in cloud and thunder to give Moses the Torah, the law and teachings that form the core of the Jewish religion. The graceful cone of Mount Fuji represents for many a sublime symbol of the beauty and spirit of the Japanese nation. The remote peak of Mount Kailas, rising aloof above the Tibetan plateau, directs the hearts and minds of millions in Indian Tibet toward the realm of the highest deities and the utmost attainments of spiritual meditation. The Hopi and Navajo view the San Francisco peaks of Arizona as a divine source of water and blessings on which their lives and communities depend. For many in the modern world, Mount Everest symbolizes the highest goal they may strive to attain, whether their pursuit be material or spiritual. Uh, the second section of the book basically looks at different regions of the world, uh, with each chapter opening with a general description of the mountains and their importance for that particular region, and then focuses on a few representative peaks in each chapter. Uh, in all, the book deals with a, a bit over 50 uh, sacred mountains in detail, but of course there are many, many more. And to give you a sense of how the chapter on the Himalayas opens, uh, the chapter in the Himalayas is the abode of the sacred. An enormous range, 1,500 miles long, the Himalayas rise in the monsoon-drenched jungles north of Myanmar to sweep in a great arc of snow and ice northwest along the borders of Indian Tibet through Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal, up to the dusty glaciers of the Karakoram on the remote desert frontier between Pakistan and China. From the plains of India, the mountains appear as luminous tracings on the far blue sky, wisps of light hinting at another world far above ours. As one approaches, they dwindle behind intervening hills to reappear in more substantial form in flashes of white, glimpsed now and then through the opening of a dark green valley. From the vantage point of a high ridge gained by an arduous climb, they emerge sharp and solid against the horizon, their glaciers glistening in the sun, too brilliant for eyes to bear. At twilight, after the colorful displays of sunset, their jagged snows soften to take on a strange lavender glow as they fade into the depths of the night. No wonder that millions of devout Hindus and Buddhists regard them as the dwelling place of the gods and the pathway to heaven. Now to give you a sense, I also in, incorporate a number of sort of personal anecdotes and experiences I've had on these mountains, as well as looking at in detail what they mean for the people who live there. And uh, in the chapter on Japan, there's a mountain called Mount Koya, and let me read a uh, more personal experience there. 
Uh, most of the visitors to Mount Koya focus their attention and devotion on the cemetery, the largest and most impressive in Japan. Over a mile long, it runs through an ancient grove of gigantic cedars whose straight trunks stand like columns of silver gray marble rising into a cloud of foliage. I came to the cemetery about a year after our son Jonathan died in a warehouse fire at a music event in Oakland, California. I asked the monk accompanying the group I was with if he would say a prayer for Jonathan. He took me to a priest who wrote with a brush and black ink our son's name in Japanese characters on the thin strip of wood at the foot of a bronze image of a Buddha. While the monk recited a mantra in a deep voice, I scooped up water with a ladle and poured it over and over Jonathan's name, its smooth flow slowly cooling and soothing the lingering grief I felt over his fiery death. When my wife and I had first come to Koya many years earlier, the cemetery with its trees had had a particularly haunting effect. Walking through the cedars, watching pilgrims make offerings to images of silent Buddhas, I had been strongly reminded of hikes we had taken through redwood groves in California, such as the Mura Woods outside San Francisco. Here, the trees rose as straight and tall with the same aura of primeval simplicity, but the additional presence of shrines and incense accentuated the natural sanctity of the forest, producing an overwhelming atmosphere of spiritual devotion in which the living could commune with the dead. A sense of another reality, another world, deeper and more mysterious than the one I knew, hovered on the edge of awareness, palpable and evanescent as the gray mist of incense floating around us, ascending toward the sky. So after looking at mountains all around the world, the second part called the power and mystery of mountains deals with the symbolism of mountains. And there I extract 10 major widespread themes or views through which mountains are experienced as sacred by people and cultures around the world. For example, the mountain is a high place epitomized by Everest. The mountain is center, center of the universe, Mount Kailas in Tibet. The mountain is a source of blessings such as water and healing. And mountain, for example, is a place of inspiration or revelation. Uh, and then what I do is using this framework, I apply it to areas that you norm don't normally think of in terms of the sacred, looking at how mountains evoke a sense of the sacred and well-known works of literature and art from the Eastern and Western culture. For example, the snows of Hilman, Kilimanjaro by Hemingway, the Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, some of the poetry of Yeats, uh, Chinese poetry, Li Bo, and so on. And then I look at using again this sort of uh, framework to look at the spiritual dimensions of mountaineering. And then the last chapter focuses on the relevance of sacred mountains for climate change, environmental conservation, and also for everyday life. Uh, and I have new sections in the second edition, for example, on work I've done with national parks that Laura referred to, and also world heritage programs that I've worked on with that. And to give a sense uh, in a way of um, uh, why the relevance of sacred mountains. I mean, we talk about sacred mountains around the world. Many of them are very distant cultures. You got a sampling of a few from a passage I read from the introduction. Uh, but many of the other mountains are uh, very unfamiliar. So let me read uh, here the opening paragraph of the last chapter, which is Sacred Mountains, the Environment and Everyday Life. For most of us, sacred mountains are remote from the experience of everyday life. They lie far off in space and time, revered by distant cultures, many of which vanished long ago. Even the peaks that we manage to climb and visit rise on the borders of our lives, removed from the cities and plains where most of us live. What is the value then of thinking about them? It is simply this, the contemplation of sacred mountains with their special power to awaken another deeper way of experiencing reality opens us to a sense of the sacred in our own homes and communities, a sense that we need to cultivate in order to live in harmony with our environment and with each other. In looking up to the heights and reflecting on the world around them, we discover within ourselves something that enables us to lead deeper and more meaningful lives. Uh, so that gives sort of an overview of the book. Uh, the first edition of the book uh, had about 120 photographs and uh, it was a large format. 
And unfortunately, from my point of view, since I put my basically most of my efforts into the text and uh, creating, you know, beautiful evocative images, um, people, many people sort of treated it as a coffee table book to look at the pretty pictures. So fortunately, the second edition, which is published recently by Cambridge University Press, this is the book here. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, anyway, it doesn't uh, appear so well here. Um, this one focuses, highlights the text, and it's in a smaller format, so you can read it easily. There are a number of photographs, about 24. They're all in black and white, um, but they're all new compared to, ex exception of one or two, compared to what was in the first edition. And one of them is the mountain you see behind me here. It's in, uh, this is in color, but uh, it's in black and white in, in the book. And this is a mountain called Huashan, uh, which is one of the five principal sacred mountains in China, the most spectacular of the sacred mountains in China. And it has huge granite walls, something like Yosemite, but rather than being sides of the valley, these walls go up and culminate in knife edge ridges and you have to walk through these temples along the crest of the ridge in order to reach the summit. It's the most spectacular of the major sacred mountains in China. So I think with that, uh, as I say, uh, sometimes people say, and I'll conclude with this thought, well, you know, sacred mountains, that's sort of an esoteric subject on the fringes of things. Well, quite the, quite the contrary, uh, since they are associated with the deepest and most central values of cultures around the world, they take us straight into what's most important and most deeply felt in people's hearts and minds uh, in cultures and traditions around the world and have great applications for even those of us who live in the modern world who may not even have any traditional uh, aspirations. And I should say, I look at the sacred very generally. Uh, it's whatever uh, evokes a sort of an experience of something of deeper significance or reality that uh, makes life meaningful and worthwhile. And that, that can be either religious or it can be uh, a communion with nature. It can be, uh, you can be a secular as well as religious in order to pursue uh, what sacred mountains have to say to us today. So Phil, let me turn it over to you and to pilgrimage because many of these mountains that I discuss in the book are places of pilgrimage. <laughs> Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. That, that's impressive. You just compressed and condensed a lifetime of work into 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I hope you all appreciate what that man just did just now. That was wonderful and very poetic. I, I love some of the new prose. So I'm looking forward to reading the second edition. I'm here because Ed and I have known each other for years. We actually taught together at, at Esalen a number of years ago. Yes, we did. That, that was marvelous. Okay. So we've had a great deal in common over the years. And I am very thankful for this long relationship that I've had with the Mechanics Institute. I wish my dad were alive to see this because he introduced me to Mark Twain when I was young. We read Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer together when I was a kid. And Mark Twain actually lectured at the Mechanics Institute. So my dad is one of those guys who would have loved that connection. <laughs> so uh, I'd love to keep this, what I used to call with Joe Cam with a long conversation going. We're talking about things that people have always been concerned about, always cared about. So thank you, Ed, for joining together this evening. I'd like to start with a, a very modest anecdote but it came to me this morning as something that helps bridge our work together. Um, and it's from the wonderful essays, Anna Quinlan, who wrote for the Boston Globe for many years. And she was out here in San Francisco for an, an event a number of years ago. And she happened to be walking across, over the Embarcadero along San Francisco Bay, looking out over the ocean and was a little bit wistful at a crossroad, which is one of the, the signifiers for the, the time, the Kairos time to embark on a pilgrimage, on a, a sacred journey somewhere. When you're at life's crossroads and you need some time to be contemplative, some time to get off your couch and walk around the world. So this is what Anna Quinlan was doing, walking along the Embarcadero and she came across a homeless man who seemed, as she writes beautifully in this essay, almost beatifically content. So she was, as a good reporter, 
wondering how he could do this. She noticed that he was um, had been sleeping on this bench for a while with and and she asked him, why aren't you in a in a, a hostel tonight? Why aren't you trying to take care of yourself in some way? Just trying to start a conversation. And he said, just look, young lady, look at the view. And she writes this so subtly, but lovely. She said she looked up and she realized she had been walking for a, quite a while around San Francisco, and she had not been looking at the views. <laughs> And yet this homeless man was who looked poor, distraught, but he had a sense of contentment because what? He was in that moment. He was feeling something sacred in the day. And so Anna Quinlan ends up her essay by saying, every time I get a little distraught, a little melancholic, I think of this brief conversation I had in San Francisco Bay with this homeless fellow who turns out is one of the happiest people I ever met. And his phrase, <coughs> excuse me, comes back to me. Look at the view, Anna. Look at the view. And as she ends the essay, she says, and if I do that, I am never disappointed. So that's a bit of a modern parable. And it drops us down into this wonderful conversation that some of our pilgrimages, some of our explorations can be grand. They can be life uh, a world tilting. I love that old phrase. But sometimes they're modest as well, walking around your own neighborhood, as something uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said in a conversation I was privy to here in San Francisco years ago when someone asked him, what is the, the ultimate message for a pilgrimage? And he said, without pause, which you then know comes from the deep sense someone has, he says, it's, it's the capacity to have gleaned something from your travel, something from your sacred journey that allows you to come home and recognize your own backyard as sacred ground. And that became then the, the direction and the arc for my book, The Art of Pilgrimage. It's good to know where to begin, and it's good to have an endpoint. All right, this is where I'm going. So that was very helpful for me when I was writing that book. That, that's where I wanted to end up. All of the wisdom... The, the epiphanies, the grand, maybe dark revelations about ourselves on these journeys, ideally help us develop a new sense of respect and even reverence for our own backyard. So how did this all begin? That's the, the great mythic question Roberto Colasso and others come up with when we're talking about uh, mythology. So for me, 1997, I was reading through the New York Times Sunday travel section, and I came across what they used to call a bullet piece, just two or three lines in the travel section. Uh, and it just said, by the year 2000, travel will become the number one business in the world. So of course, as an inveterate traveler and a tour leader that seized my attention, and I read it was a very brief piece, but what it what it suggested also had its aspect of being a parable. If you remember the lines in the Old Testament about how someday we shall <clears throat> hope to turn swords into plowshares. So this article was saying, because of the recent upsurge in travel, 1997, uh, so 25 years ago or so, Travel is taking tourism is overtaking the armaments industry as the number one business in the world, and that's it's got its parable value. There's a wonderful metaphor in there. Things have gone topsy turvy since because of the recent wars, but I still love the power of the, of the metaphor. Uh, but as an old journalist, I had to ask why. So I did a little hunting around, hunting and pecking, and discovered that traditional pilgrimage had had an upsurge throughout the 90s in all of the world's religions from, from Islam to Judaism, uh, Christianity, but there was also an, an uptick, if you will, in the reference to and the reconsideration of things like travels to, uh, to see uh, precious disappearing animals in Africa. There are the, the word pilgrimage was being used to describe going to the, <clears throat> the Bronte sisters home in Yorkshire, England, pilgrimage was being used to describe going to scientific centers like uh, Albert Einstein's office in Zurich, Switzerland, where he had his 
three great breakthroughs in physics in, I believe, 1905. So that began to move me a bit. And I said, there's a book here. What is happening in the world that we are traveling more than ever, safer, uh, longer, more grandiose tours, but that also we have expanded our notion of pilgrimage and what is sacred to include the secular. So that then became the, the touchstone, so to speak, of my book. There are plenty of other books about traditional travel. Let's say the, uh, Michael Wolf's wonderful book, uh, the, the, what is it, The Thousand Roads to Mecca. He covers traditional pilgrimage in that sense, in, in Islam. Many books about the uh, road to Santiago de Compostela, Rome, and so on. But no one, as far as I know, had ever tried to find what the overlap was between the two, which is what I did. And I found a, a number of points of overlap, commonalities. And so I divided the book into seven simple sections. The longing, because all great ideas, all great creativity, uh, all, all travel takes place in this moment of, <clears throat> I'm at a crossroad in life. Uh, my best friends can't help me anymore. My, my, my spiritual counselor, my psychologist, nobody can help me anymore. Often, at least I count through about 60,000 years of human behavior. If you go back to the Australian Aborigine walkabout, which is roughly 60,000 years old, that's the, the date I've gotten from them, by the way. For about 60,000 years, people have come to uh, moments of crisis like this <clears throat> and decided enough talk. I need to walk. Or in Ed's case, I need to climb. <laughs> so I use this as my metaphor, the longing. And then the, the, there, can, there can be a call. It can be a spiritual call. It can be a, a secular call. Uh, the departure. Every tradition that I examine has a, a number of rituals that one might go through to properly prepare for a, a pilgrimage. And it could, can be cutting the hair, changing your garments, changing your diet, uh, a series of prayers. Uh, I interviewed Houston Smith, my, my dear friend, about the way that he would travel the world. When, when I asked him, Houston, <clears throat> how many pilgrimages have you been on? And his voice dropped an octave and he said, Phil? I have girdled the globe 12 times, <laughs> which I found was a wonderful phrase. And, and I, I love the cadence of that. And he, he began to tell me his own approach to this was similar to what I was doing, cobbling together what you might say is the, the wisdom that's been gleaned from all these different traditions. Because as Ed, maybe we can talk about that when we, when we come together, <clears throat> things that don't work rituals, ceremonies, that practices that aren't effective anymore tend to fall by the way, wayside if they're not working. Because I remember you telling me at Esalen once, uh, Ed, that for every tradition, including monks uh, moving around Mount, Mount Kailash, pilgrimage can also be rote behavior if we're not careful. So that's what also what I build into the book. Then there's the pilgrim's way, <coughs> the labyrinth, because in all kinds of travel, including pilgrimage, there will be a kind of confrontation with the dark night of the soul. Why did I leave home? Why did I come with these people? <laughs> why didn't I travel alone? Or why did I choose this destination? Uh, you might have trouble at customs. Uh, did, you, did you read the story about uh, uh, an American who had bought a, a Subway sandwich, I think at Heathrow, and mistakenly didn't finish it, put it in her backpack. And when she flew to Australia, they, uh, they found the sandwich in her backpack at customs oh, yeah. and then fined her $3,500 for bringing food illegally into their country. So this is something I write about in the book too. Know the customs, know the laws, because you are about to cross some thresholds. There are many of these sacred ritual aspects to these kinds of travel. So I just, I encourage people to, to brush up on, on, the, on the cultures of, and the customs of wherever you're going. Uh, the moment of arrival tends to be very traditionalistic everywhere. There are certain customs that you, it's very wise to know how to behave, how to dress and so on. And then the final chapter, we can you and I could talk about this as well. It's uh, 
bringing back the boon. What happens when you come home again? All of this, by the way, if you have, are well read in sociology, mythology, uh, anthropology, some of this might be familiar, familiar. One of the models that I used for this, of course, was from Joe Campbell, who I worked with extensively for eight years. I wrote the film and the book about his life, The Hero's Journey. But Joe would have been the first to tell you that he got his model of The Hero Journey, not from his own imagination. He put it together, but he got it from Thomas Mann, Carl Jung, James Joyce, and especially this curious uh, scholar from Europe, uh, Van Gennep, G-E-N-N-E-P, who wrote a brilliant book on rites of passage, I believe in the 1920s. And this then became the, the, the foundation of the hero's journey, which then helps me write the, the, uh, the Art of Pilgrimage. Why it's relevant here? Because I believe, along with many great travel writers throughout time, from Dante to Pico Iyer, <laughs> that well-rehearsed, respectful, reverent travel can change people. It's a, the rites of passage model itself. It was Van Gennep's way of saying that these, there are forms of rites of initiation. There are ways in which we can learn and teach each other. There are ways we can, uh, ask questions of the natural world as you so beautifully do, Ed. And then gleaning that wisdom, we slowly incrementally change our own consciousness. So that's at the, at the heart of a book like mine because what I've, I've gleaned, I talked to, even we have my friend Palma here was just with me on my tour to, to Italy. She'll remember that I, I talked about this here. One of the dirty secrets in the travel business is how many people are actually dissatisfied. We're not supposed to talk about this, but it, it, it happens. People are, are mad at their travel agent. They're, they're mad at the hotels. They're mad at the tour companies, uh, disappointed in the center. I remember standing in front of Shark Cathedral a number of years ago when I was teaching, uh, using the, the, the famous Shark Labyrinth as a model for uh, creativity. And I heard someone stand next to me looking up at the cathedral, the beautiful rose window and saying, it looked a lot better in the video, Maud. <laughs> so <laughs> this is shocking to me. This is sacrilegious. <laughs> but it's also very revelatory in the sense, if you are reduced to saying something like that, oh, it looked better in the video. Oh, it, it read better in the book by Henry Adams about shark. You haven't prepared. You are not centered. You are either condescending or you're unprepared. So many things can happen. So a book like mine is really offered up in the, in the spirit of trying to help people deepen their travels, get to the core of what I think of as sometimes the soul of the world, the anima mundi, uh, the genius loci, the heartbeat, the truth of a place. So just a couple more comments on this, and then Ed, you and I can talk. I think one, one famous book about mountains that has inspired both of us is the one by Rene Dumal, Mount Analog, which I learned first from Joe Campbell, of all people. It's just from a single footnote when he uses this book about the ascent of a mountain, which is unfinished, by the way, because this great scholar, he was also an Indologist. He wrote beautifully about uh, Indian mythology, Indian religion. He died probably a chapter away from finishing the book. But what he left us was one of the great explorations of using the mountain as a metaphor for raising one's consciousness. And he has a line that I just recall, I just remembered it's one of the epigraphs for my own book, the, uh, the Art of Pilgrimage, in which he says, like I use the word, the art of pilgrimage rather than the technique of, uh, I could have used so many others, but Dumal uh, inspired me here when he said, art is here taken to me knowledge realized in action. And this is an old sense in religions around the world that it behooves us to get out of the synagogue, the, the, the church, the cathedral, the mosque, get off the couch, 
and put your feet to the foot to your, the soles of your shoes or your sandals to the soul of the world. So you're realizing your prayers, trying to lift your consciousness in some way in the actual world itself. So Damal helped me there. Um, and then finally, <laughs> a kind of unexpected realization. But uh, uh, two days ago, I just gave a, a three hour presentation to the uh, Jung on the Hudson group, the New York Society for Jungian Studies. Three hours on my new book, which you could see here, The Lost Notebooks of Sisyphus. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite stories is, again, it's a tremendous model of behavior, for, model for, as Jung himself said, forging consciousness. How do we change our mind? How do we change our hearts? Is it, is it even possible? So Sisyphus to me has been a model. Uh, I've used this metaphor for teaching writing and filmmaking for many, many years. And then Ed, it, it dawned on me that the whole middle portion of that myth from the ancient Greeks and the mid portion of my book is of course what happens when the king of Corinth is condemned for not betraying but for revealing something pretty nasty that the god Zeus has done. So he's condemned to the underworld to do what? This is one of the most recognizable mythic images in history. And I'm told it's the most popular motif for New Yorker cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill has, <clears throat> has become a, a common motif for uh, jokes about work. How often can I go back to the office pushing this boulder up the hill and I'm never pushing that boulder over the other side? It's, it's been used to discuss sports. Uh, his boulder then becomes a baseball, pushing the baseball up the hill or uh, raising children. This is us. You and I, baby, we're trying to raise this kid together, pushing the boulder up the mountain. It can seem, as it was taught during the Middle Ages, by the way, as being a story about futility. But I believe, as Albert Camus did in his famous essay, uh, Rollo May, one of the great humanist psychologists of our time, that it's actually an antidote for the very naive and very corrosive American myth of unrelenting individualism, that I can always make more money, I can always have a bigger house, a better car, all this accumulation. I had a long discussion with the great Rollo May about this, and he said, this is one of the great metaphors of our time, pushing something ourselves, maybe pushing the boulder up the mountain until we realize there is a moment when we need to do what? To let go. Let go of expectations. Let go of the belief that we can constantly, constantly grow while destroying the earth and so on. So maybe there'll be something for us to talk about there. <laughs> As uh, there, there are two sides. There's a transcendent notion of, put, uh, of going up the mountain, having some kind of realization at the top. And then there's the other. There's the metaphor for the difficulty in life, the difficulty of simply coping, going to work every day, uh, raising our kids, uh, getting through the pandemic. The, the Sisyphus metaphor was used over and over as, as a cartoon. When will this ever end? When will this ever end? So th there you go. A few things to think about. Laura, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear um, Ed's response to that, it, that metaphor. And <laughs> from your experience on mountains. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say, you know, uh, Phil and I did do these uh, two workshops at S1. And actually, it was on another subject of great interest to us, which directly relates to uh, Phil's last book, which is a subject of myth and the importance of myth and, and what it reveals about uh, who we are and our aspirations. Uh, looking at you know, myths, I, I'm especially interested in myths, in uh, living myths of traditional cultures. Often we look at ancient Greek myths, which are literary myths today, but they don't have the power that they did for the ancient Greeks. Uh, but that's, that's all very important. And I, I just wanted to say, Phil, I, I really enjoyed doing those workshops with you and keeping up our, our uh, friendship over the years. Now, uh, as far as going up, I mean, sometimes going up the mountain can be, uh, you know, it can be, feel like you're pushing a rock. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
one of the deepest experience I probably ever had in the mountains was on a mountain called Annapurna. And let me back up a little because there's a very amusing story about this. Um, there's a book called Annapurna by Maurice Herzog. It was the first of the world's highest peaks to be climbed in 1950. It's a classic of Himalayan mountaineering. Um, when I was a teenager, my younger sister, who was about 12 at the time, checked the book out of the library, and she thought it was a Nancy Drew mystery story about a girl named Annapurna. <laughs> she was partly right, because Annapurna is the name of a goddess, Annapurna, she was filled with rice. But when she opened it up, she, she wasn't interested, and she tossed it on her bed, and I happened to come in, and I found the book, and I read it, and it was really, uh, it, it really inspired me. Uh, and uh, later on, um, I went on an expedition to one of the peaks in the Annapurna range. And as I say, I was trying to make up for all sorts of things that had gone wrong. I went to the Peace Court in Nepal, uh, dreaming of the mountains, and they put me on the plains down next to India, where it was very flat, very hot, 110 <laughs> degrees, no electricity. And I could see just in the far distance, occasionally when the, when the haze you know, dissipated, I could get a glimpse of the Himalayas. And it was sort of like, uh, being in hell and seeing heaven and, and experiencing hell even more deeply because I could glimpse heaven where I wasn't. Uh, and eventually I left and went up into the mountains. And on Annapurna, I walked into a huge avalanche, which was a transformative event for me. But the reason I relate it to your Sisyphus myth, or not yours, but the Sisyphus myth of the ancient Greeks is, on the expedition, I was trying to make up for... Uh, having felt myself a failure, I went to the Peace Corps to help the people and I finally had to quit because I was drawn to the mountains. You talk about the call in your book in your great book on pilgrimage uh, and the call is essential to a pilgrimage or a quest or a journey. I felt, you know, just called to the Himalayas. I felt I should be staying there in the plains doing my Peace Corps work. That was the reasonable thing to do, but something kept on pulling me to go and I finally left, but I left with an awful lot of feelings of chagrin over what I'd done, shame of, of having sort of blown it. And I went up there and I was trying to climb the mountain in order to make up for that. And it was just a really ordeal. It was like pushing the rock up the mountain, uh, up the glacier in this case. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally this avalanche hit. I won't go into the, I, I, the, the end of the chapter on the Himalayas has a long description of the avalanche and what I went through. But the night after the avalanche, I thought I was gonna have a terrible time sleeping that I would have terrible nightmares. Um, in fact, I had the best night's sleep I'd had in an awfully long time. Uh, I've been having a terrible time getting to sleep at altitude. We were up at almost 20,000 feet and it keeps you up at night. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and the, the first time on the entire expedition, I felt like climbing the mountain just for the sheer joy of climbing it. Now, I wasn't able to do that because I'd lost everything, my glasses, my pack, even my identity, I lost my passport <laughs> in the avalanche and I had to come down. But it was a lesson, a transformative lesson that took me actually years to fully understand. And what I eventually realized is when I, or I think any of us do things for the joy of doing them, that's when we do them best. That's when we fulfill ourselves and when we also have our best effect on other people. That was a major lesson, a transformative lesson. Uh, so. That's what you're. That's what the what the, the rolling the ball up the mountain makes me think of. Uh, however, uh, I was hit by an awful lot of chunks of ice rolling down the mountain. <laughs> the avalanche, so it can go the other way. The rocks can sweep you down as well as up. Well, as my old friend Angelus Arian used to say, the the Bohemian, uh, the, the Basque mystic and anthropologist, I'd like to hitchhike on that point. And the point <laughs> is uh, the point of joy. I'm so I'm so glad you brought that up because that I, I've thought about you a number of times over the last few years when I am cobbling together my itineraries for these art and literary pilgrimages that I lead, including just in April to Italy and to Greece. I try to culminate them with exactly that, a sense of joy. Now, how can we achieve that? because travel can be grueling, it's challenging, it's demanding. I try to find the highest place possible in the last two or three days of the trip. And it's there, well, either we're climbing figuratively on uh, Crete just four or five years ago. My co-leader was a Cretan uh, archeologist. We climbed Mount Ida, I believe it was 29, 
hundred meters to get yeah. an overview of Crete and absolute joy. And he told me how he had had an epiphany, very Zorba-like epiphany on the top of this mountain because he, he, was, he had just been diagnosed with cancer. Ooh. He had had some tragedies in his own life. So he wanted to go up to the highest peak where there was a, an altar to the goddess. And he wanted to say a prayer to the goddess to ask him which way to then go with his life. So four or five of us on the trip, we, we actually accompanied him up there. We were together with him with a sense of solidarity, which you write about beautifully in your books about taking leaders to the tops of mountains. And then you lift your prayers up to the heavens, up to the gods and the goddesses there and hope that they are achieved. There was tremendous joy in all of us doing that together. Just recently on Italy, in Italy with Palma here, one of our participants tonight, we ended up in Corfu, the island of Corfu. And um, we went up to the, the top of a, a, a fortress to do what? It was a little rigorous to get up to the top, but it had an overview of the entire island there. And that becomes then uh, a source of where I will create some kind of uh, practice, ritual, a, a ceremony of some sorts while I'll ask people, let's look back now. What have we done over the last week? What stood out? What was your, for in Italy, what was your La Dolce Vita moment? <laughs> your sweet moment. And then you talk about these and you try to give the entire journey some perspective. That happens when you go to the highest place. Uh, it could be a, a cathedral. You climb to the top of the, of the mountain for the cathedral, wherever that might be. So, and I've thought about you about, about this because you taught me that, that the, the exhilaration, the effort that takes place in going up to the highest point can or should bring us some kind of joy. So thank you for that gift, Ed. <laughs> Uh, thank, and thank you for the gifts as well as in your book. Uh, yeah, no, that you mentioned, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I also climbed uh, Mount Ida in, in Crete as well uh, because I went with a colleague, the National Geographic sent us there uh, to explore the possibilities of stories linking sacred mountains to ancient Greek mythology and archeology. span mm -hmm. So we went from climbing Mount Olympus in the North down to Crete in the South. And since you mentioned Crete, there's a famous paradox called the Cretan paradox, which is all Cretans lie, I am a Cretan. <laughs> and then you're caught in a circle. So that the reason that uh, that paradox came about and it was called the Cretan paradox is that the Greeks, uh, you know, according to uh, Greek mythology, Zeus was born in a cave at either the foot of Mount Dicte or Mount Ida. And then he was raised in a cave at the foot of Mount Ida. Uh, hidden from his father Kronos, uh, who would have otherwise eaten him if he'd known he was still alive. In fact, uh, uh, it won't go into all of that. But the reason people talk about the Cretan paradox is that elsewhere in Greece, Zeus was the king of the gods and you know he lived forever more or less, but the Cretans believed that Zeus had died and was buried in Crete. And everybody said, well, all Cretans are liars because Zeus didn't die. <laughs> I can use that. Thank you. Thank but, you. Uh, but you know, the other thing is, yeah, it, you go into places like uh, like Greece, where there is this, uh, you know, history of pilgrimage and myth. One of the things I talk about is uh, a lot of myths in uh, sacred mountains, and myths sort of gather around mountains like clouds around the mountains. And uh, the first time I climbed Mount Olympus, I had two experiences that seemed to come straight out of Greek mythology. I got to, I was hitchhiking up the coast of Greece. I'd come back from India, Nepal, and I, uh, I was gonna climb Olympus and I ran into a blind Englishman who was traveling around sightseeing. And the Greeks were very puzzled by this. How can you sightsee, you can't see? And he said, well, I touch things. So he heard I was gonna go up the mountain and he asked me to take him up. And oh my God, I'm not gonna do that. Until we ran into a couple of Swiss who had a climbing rope so we could do it safely. So we put him on the rope and we started climbing. And to go up to the top of the highest mountain peak of Mount Olympus, you actually have to use your hands. It's a, you know, a rock scramble. So we were showing him where to put his hands. And I looked at him and I saw this sort of joy radiating out of his face as he was going up the mountains. And I thought of Tiresias 
the blind seer of ancient Greek mythology, who was said to have been able to see more in his blindness than those with sight. And I was wondering whether our companion wasn't experiencing more of the mountain in his blindness than we who could see it shining in the sunlight around us. So I left him on the summit, and there's another summit of Mount Olympus called, nicknamed the Throne of Zeus. That found it very appealing. <laughs> so I decided to go off and climb it by myself. I didn't have a guidebook. And as you say in, in, uh, in the uh, Art of Pilgrimage, it's very important to prepare yourself and learn as much about where you're going. Well, I hadn't done that. <laughs> so I started climbing this thing and it turned out to be much more difficult than I thought. I got on a knife edge ridge. Uh, it got very eerie. The mist came in. There was a thousand foot drop on one side, 500 feet on the other. I came to a place where I had to go under an overhang out over the thousand foot face and my legs started to shake. So I pulled back and I started thinking, well, what am I going to do? And at that very moment, a flight of black birds came sweeping out of the mist across the top of the ridge and disappeared on the other side. Well, it turns out black birds are omens from Zeus himself. And I remembered from reading the Odyssey and the Iliad in college that bird flights were always omens for the ancient Greeks. If the birds flew from one direction, it was a good sign. If they flew from the other, it was a bad sign. But I couldn't remember which direction was which. <laughs> so I thought about it for a moment. And then I went across. I made the move and I got to the top. So I figured it was the right direction. And a couple of years later, I was talking to a friend of mine who was the chair of the classics department at Harvard. And I asked him which direction was which. And he couldn't remember either. <laughs> so I didn't feel so badly about it. That's a great story. Uh, Laura, before we take questions, a very brief re response to that. W what you just awakened to me because of the pure joy that you are telling these stories with is that I'm already organizing for tours for 2023. So I'm in conversation with land agents in Greece and Italy alike. And both are saying that they're experiencing what they, they think will be a robust and record setting year in 2023 for travel. So there is such a pent up desire, <coughs> excuse me, from all around the world because we've been what? We've been on the couch. We have been cloistered at home, choose your image. And what then happens when we are corralled in? Our, our desire for freedom, which is a word we haven't used, but I think it's at the heart of travel. It's at the heart of the create, creative enterprise is about to be exercised. So let me end uh, briefly with this. What, I was in conversation once with the great uh, Jungian psychologist, uh, James Hillman, and talking about this, this, the power of this notion of the, the transformative journey, which is how I think of pilgrimage. It's a spiritually transformative journey to a sacred place. One way to think about it is to put the, the, the prefix RE in front of the verbs we're using. And then you can get to the heart of why this kind of travel moves us and occasionally changes us. We are renewed rejuvenated, reintegrated, maybe with lost parts of ourself, revitalized, on and on and on. So maybe you could play with that. Uh, what is it in you that is really longing to be renewed, revitalized right now? And where can you go that might spark that kind of, let's call it joy? Laura? Yeah, let, me, let me add yeah. to that as well. Uh, for pilgrimage places, you know, the pilgrimages can also be pilgrimages. I, I think it's very important, as you say, to get out and walk. But uh, I always think of um, T.S. Eliot's, um, uh, you know, uh, passage. Uh, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploration will be to return to where we started and know the place for the first time. And that's what I think the most important thing to bring back from a pilgrimage going to a mountain. And I should add, sacred mountains, uh, yes, some of them you climb, some of them you walk around like Kailas, uh, others you just contemplate for the distance. And the beauty of the subject is that, you know, you don't have to climb the mountain. You don't even have to walk around it. You can just contemplate it from the distance. Uh -huh. And there's a famous quote from the Puranas, the Hindu Puranas saying uh, that the sight, even the thought of Himachal of Himalaya will cleanse you of your sins. Wow. And bringing that in. And then there's this quote I'd, I'd like to sort of finish with. Uh, it, this is from uh, 
China's one of China's greatest landscape painters, uh, Guo Xi from the uh, Song Dynasty around the 11th, 12th centuries. And this is what he has to say about landscapes and landscape paintings and their value. The din of the dusty world and the confines of human habitations are what human nature habitually abhors, while on the contrary, haze, mist, and the haunting spirits of the mountains are what human nature seeks and yet can rarely find, what you're looking for in the pilgrimage. Having no access to the landscapes, the lover of forest and stream, the friend of mist and haze, enjoys them only in his dreams. How delightful then to have a landscape painted by a skilled hand. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. Before we jump into uh, questions in the chat, I just want to throw out a few things and, and ask you, going back to that essence of joy, um, because I want you, Ed, to tell us about what mountain is behind you there. And also my question is, what place or places or mountains resonate with you? And I'd like both of you to answer. What, where We often go to a place or a city or whatever, and we just feel like we belong there or it resonates with us deeply. And other than like Annapurna, which you've mentioned and other places that you've gone to on Crete, uh, were there other places that resonated with you? Well, in, in, the, in my case, uh, well, first of all, the mountain behind me is called Huashan. It's uh, the highest of the five main sacreds. It's the Western mountain, the mountains in China, the main sacred mountains are in the four quarters and one in the center. And incidentally, China has probably the longest record of ascents of mountains in the world. Uh, it goes back to maybe the third millennium before the common era. The first legendary emperors of China were supposed to have gone and climbed the mountains in the four quarters to establish their sovereignty over the realm. This is one of them. Uh, it's since become a place of transformation, what you emphasize in your uh, book on pilgrimage, because this is where Taoists go to transform themselves into immortals and to meditate and be on the mountain. Um, you know, when I was younger, I, I was focusing on high mountains. I really started climbing in the Andes when my father was in the Foreign Service and uh, uh, we moved to Ecuador. In fact, my earliest memories are snow-capped peaks on the equator because we went to Ecuador when I was two, and those are my earliest memories. And then it came back when I was a teenager, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be neat to go up to snow on the equator, the conjunction of opposites? Somebody put me in touch with an Ecuadorian mountaineering club, and I started climbing with them. And uh, they, the club had a great evocative name, which was New Horizons and the new horizons you get from going to a mountain and so on. So, you know, I went to the Himalayas because they were high and I got interested in the culture. But to tell you the truth, as I went on exploring what mountains mean to people, I developed a growing appreciation for smaller and smaller mountains. And also the fuller, not just climbing a mountain, but seeing life as a journey or an ultimate pilgrimage, which is basically more like trekking through the Himalayas. You go up over a pass, you may climb a peak, you go down into a valley, you have another hop up and down. That's the way life goes. And that's also how pilgrimages go. It's not just going up to the top. And if you focus entirely on getting to the top of the mountain, the problem is you can't stay there very long. So what do you bring back? <laughs> so you can bring back that sense of joy, the memory of something that sustains you during the down periods that you talked about, Phil, you know, the, you know when everything's going wrong in life, you can sort of recall that memory. There's another thing that's very important about mountains. If you get to the top of the mountain, you're not only reaching its high point, you're reaching its center, because that's where the center emerges from it. And if you can get that sense of being centered, which you see from the top of a mountain, you see the whole world around you and feel yourself as a center, that sense of centeredness gives you the balance and serenity to get through the turmoil, especially today with what's going on. And I just taught a class uh, for uh, UC Berkeley Extend, uh, Ali on uh, sacred mountains. And I, you know, I concluded by saying, mountains remind you that the world is a place of beauty and splendor, what you experience if you take a real pilgrimage. And you know, that can sustain you and realize that there's more than just what's going on in the politics and what's happening and, and even climate change. There is an underlying something that's worth getting out there, experiencing, and bringing back into your life. Ed, you, you just reminded me, and in response to your question, Laura, that one of the, in, in the last chapter of Mount Analog, the wonderful Rene Dumas book, 
he writes something that's had a deep influence on me and feels very Buddhist in nature. And that is that the most important part of the, the ascent of the mountain is actually finding a place to leave a cache behind, C-A-C-H-E. It could be food. It could be boots for someone who's coming up behind you. You're leaving something that will help those who are following in your footsteps along their own ascent, along their own path. And I think there's a powerful, powerful metaphor there that we're not only climbing for ourselves, mm -hmm. we're not only writing for ourselves, we're writing, helping, teaching, putting on book events like this, Laura, to help those who are just behind us. And that in itself brings me a great deal of joy to follow up on your question, Laura. So a few quick places for me, these are different ways of saying, I feel home here. Those of you who are listening in, I'm sure you have felt that sense of astonishment. My first time in Dublin, Ireland, I felt like I was home, walking in the footsteps of my heroes, uh, Sean O'Casey, Beckett, James Joyce, of course, uh, Paris, walking in the footsteps of Hemingway. I felt home. I'm French, Cousineau, right? We're, we're the, the family that comes from, from, uh, from Paris but especially Greece. So I had this feeling, a mighty experience of this just recently, when I took my group, the highlight of the Greece tour, just in April and again next spring, going to Ithaca, which is the great island destination for what? For getting home again. Yeah. Our word nostalgia, by the way, comes from this. The nostoi is a great old Greek word that means the return. So the Odyssey is made up of stories of return, stories of how we get home again. But in the, the Greek brilliance is you put nostalgia, nostalgia together with algae, which is pain. Going home again can also have some pain involved. If I go back to Detroit, it's not all, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> It's not all peaches and cream to go back to Detroit, as you might imagine. That's built into our great stories. Where can we go that will help revitalize us, rejuvenate us, bring us some sense of joy, but at the same time, risking that there could be some pain involved. So I, I, I give it to all of you out there listening tonight. Where could you go that would help you, in many senses, come back to life again? Because that's what this metaphor is about. All of us, for one reason or another, one circumstance after another, it could be a pandemic, it could be war, it could be a change of job, it could be a death in the family. We all have to start over again and again and again. And the model of pilgrimage has been with us for millennia, I think, to help us do this. Yeah, no, I would agree. And, and I think, you know, I relate in particular to the Odyssey because the journey there is the journey home. You know, it, it doesn't take uh, it, it doesn't take Odysseus very long to get to Troy, but it takes him a long, long time to get back home. And I, I related to that personally because I've been on a number of journeys and out to the Himalayas and I go out there very quickly in an airplane. And then I, I came back by land. It took about 11 months and it was a long journey home. And the point is, it's the sense of being at home. When you feel completely at home, you feel oneness, you feel at home, not only with yourself, but with others. And, uh, you know, I like there's, there's this great Navajo uh, prayer, may I walk with beauty before me, may I walk with beauty behind me. Uh, the word that's actually translated as beauty is hojo, which means it's a sense of beauty that comes out of being in harmony with yourself, with others, and with your environment. So I, I agree with you, you know, it's not just you go off to a mountain and a pilgrimage for yourself, you do it, you know, as well for the benefit of others. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out in Mount Analog, um, you know, it's in essential in order for you to get to the next stage of the journey that you leave something behind to help others who are coming, be coming with you. And that there's also can be a great sense of camaraderie. And I'm sure you've experienced that. And uh, taking people on the tours of pilgrimages, I've you know, done a number of uh, lit treps in the Himalayas, and I was doing things on leadership. And, you know, we, we take these really type A people, uh, business people who were very competitive, 
uh, back in New York and you put them out in the Himalayas and suddenly they become very cooperative <laughs> <laughs> in a very different atmosphere and they start to really work together and they turn to things that are spiritual, which they can't really accept back mm -hmm. home or they'd be laughed at back home. So it's a very powerful experience to get away from where you take everything for granted, experience the world fresh and new, and as you say, bring that back home. We've got a question in the chat and Pam is gonna be reading out uh, questions from the audience. So uh, Pam, would you like to uh, read this question here? It's, it's a question from Ellen Jonk. Could you provide some comments about building structures on mountains? e.g. way stations, shrines, creating cultural landscapes versus keeping the mountains natural without structures. We don't really see this in the US thinking the mountains should be kept naturals. Okay, that's, that's a, a very good point. Um, you know, certainly, for example, you go to Taishan, which is the most important sacred mountain in China and you climb it and I've climbed it. It's about 5,000 feet high. And if you're going there thinking for a natural wilderness experience, you'll be deeply disappointed because the mountain has the influence of, uh, basically there are Buddhist sutras carved into the rocks. There are temples all over it. There are people going up, but it's a really rich cultural experience. And as I indicated in the quote that I read about Koyasan, uh, yes, it was like walking through the Muir woods but there were all these monuments, you know, little Buddha images and so on in the woods that really enhanced the effect of it. So that can work together. On the other hand, it can work against. Um, and I often compare Mount Kailas to Jerusalem. Incidentally, Jerusalem in the Bible is really seen as a conflation of two mount, sacred mountains, Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. Um, and uh, if you look uh, with Kailas, Kailas, they're both, Kailas is sacred to, uh, followers of four major religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and the indigenous religion of Bun. Jerusalem, of course, is sacred to Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Big difference is in Kailas, a Buddhist can stand next to a Hindu and they can look at the mountain. One of them can visualize it as the abode of Shiva, one of the three forms of the supreme deity in Hinduism. The other can see it as a pagoda palace of a Buddhist deity called Chakrasambara. And they don't have to squabble over it. They can each have and be with each other. But the trouble with Jerusalem, when you put man-made structures on it is you impose one particular view. And that leads to an awful lot of strife in Jerusalem because uh, for many uh, fundamentalist Christians or Jews, you know, Jesus cannot come back or the Messiah can't come until the temple is reconstructed, but it happens to be on the site of a Muslim mosque. So that means that needs to be blown up and torn down. So you get strife happening there. And then finally, to answer the question, uh, Mount Olympus, a number of years ago, um, there were plans to build a, a tourist development up high on the mountain with fake temples and images of the gods and put a cable car up to the summit. This aroused consternation in the Western world and about 250 climbers went, climbed it to demonstrate against it. Uh, there were various uh, Nobel Prize winners like Gunter Grass who wrote letters condemning this idea, showing the importance of Mount Olympus as a symbol of uh, Western civilization and the need to keep it, uh, you know, keep it from being sort of trivialized by the wrong kind of tourism. Excellent. I think you covered it, Ed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Another question then? Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll jump in. Sure. Um, yeah, well, let's, I just wanted to also touch base on the climate change issue and what areas and what mountains are being threatened. We just had a report, you know, recently KQED was talking about, um, you know, one scientist was talking about the the melting, uh, this, this, in other words, the snow that is on mountains with climate change and um, increase in temperatures, that the melting of the ice packs on the mountains will will dissipate, and this will affect so much of our life and resources today. But I wondered, Ed, if there, if you are, in, you know, are up, appraised on what areas of the world are in the most danger, and what can be done. 
Um, well, you know, mountains. mountains and especially mountains with glaciers and snow, um, they're the canaries along with the Arctic and the Antarctic where, you know, climate change effects are, are seen most quickly. Uh, and in fact, what a lot of people don't realize is over half the world's population depends on mountains for water, either in the form of rivers or rain clouds and so on. I mean, here in California, we depend on the snow cover of the Sierra Nevada and it's dissipating and dwindling away. Uh, where you have sacred mountains, for example, in the Andes near the driest desert in the world outside of Antarctica, the Atacama Desert, there are villages there that uh, rely entirely on the snow melt from the glaciers. And once the glaciers are gone, life won't be sustainable. Um, let me just uh, tell you an, an amusing story. It's also deeply, uh, the, uh, it affects the sacredness of mountains as well. I mean, if a mountain is revered because it's white and pure, and then as in the case of a, a mountain in Ecuador called Cotacachi near the equator, all the snow has disappeared, people take that as a sign that the goddess of the mountain or Mama Cotacachi is now angry with them. And, you know, they feel that, you know, they've lost something that's really important. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Everest area in Nepal, and a friend of mine was the uh, incarnate Lama Rinpoche of Tengoshe Monastery, the main monastery in the south side. He felt that climate change was happening because the practice of religion was dwindling away, and this was uh, an effect of it. And he, uh, within his own tradition, was trying to do something about it. So he uh, was making these special ritual vases, which he would give to Sherpas to put in critical places like the summit of Everest to arrest climate change. So he gave me one of these to come uh, to bring back and plant here in California. So I got to the airport in Kathmandu, I was going through security and the Nepali security guy looked at it and he said, what's inside? And I said, I don't know. And he said, open it up. And I said, I can't, it's, it's a, you know, a Dharma object, it's a religious object, it won't work anymore. And he said, you gotta open it up. So I said, can I talk to your uh, supervisor? So the supervisor came over, same thing. So out of desperation, I said, look, Appa Sherpa, who was a national hero in Nepal, he climbed Everest 19 times more than anyone else. I said, he took one of these up to the summit of Mount Everest. And the guy said, are you a climber? And I said, yes, although I was kind of a has-been, I haven't climbed in a long time. And he said, okay, you can take it through. So I came back and I know a Tibetan Lama who worked with me on my book on Shambhala, Lama Kunga in Kensington. And he, he knew the rituals about these uh, vases. He was making them for other purposes. So he and I and my son David went up into Tilden Park in Berkeley, very surreptitiously with a spade because you're not supposed to be digging up a regional park. <laughs> and we dug a hole, he performed a ritual and he buried it with a good view. And later on, I, I talked to the director of the East Bay Regional Park District and said, well, you know, we did something illegal at Tilden Park. And he said, that's OK. Um, let me, I have a couple. Let a me couple. try to address that very quickly. Just a very practical way of, of dealing with this. Uh, Ed, I loved your response. That was, was poetic. It was uh, uh, politically astute. A friend of mine is uh, Jeff Greenwald, who wrote a famous yeah. travel book called Shopping for Buddhas. He's an old friend of ours. He has a, a group now called the Ethical Traveler. Mm -hmm. And if any of you are about to leave on a, on a journey, uh, check this out before you leave, because he has a, a running list of 10, 12, sometimes 15 different points for you to consider before you leave. For example, uh, if you were going to stay at a certain hotel, make a couple inquiries. Does the money that you are paying, let's say they're in, in Uruguay or Chile or Nepal, does it stay there in that town, in that village, or does it disappear and go away to some major corporation so, and you, your money isn't staying there? Check out the, the ethical behavior of the, of the uh, restaurants that you're going to, the tour company. These are all practical ways that we can all say, uh, I am aware of the traveler's footprint. I, I have thought this through. I, I know there are some dangers involved. If I, if I take this, this 8,000 mile journey, if I spend all this money, but there is a way for us to think this through and say, my journey can help. It can help keep some money. It can raise some uh, political, ecological, even spiritual behavior because my group will be respectful. 
in these different sites. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, Thank you. I have a couple of questions from people. Um, from Lynn, it's is Mount Shasta a sacred mountain? And Laura asks about Mount Diablo. Well, to answer both of your questions, they're both sacred mountains. In fact, I have a whole section in the chapter in North America on Mount Shasta. It's uh, sacred to all sorts of new group, you know, new age and other religions. But even more important, it's sacred to a number of uh, American Indian tribes in the area, such as the Shasta and the Wintoon. And I participated in a ceremony. Well, actually, I can't say I participated. I was allowed to be there at a sacred spring on the side of uh, Mount Shasta. That and a ritual is being conducted by a Wintu spiritual doctor and healer named Flora Jones. So it's a, a very important sacred mountain here in California. Uh, Diablo is a sacred mountain. Uh, and in fact, um, I did have a section on it in my book, but my editor in the first edition said, well, you already got so much on California, you've got to drop something. So unfortunately, I dropped it. Uh, but a friend of mine is the executive director of Save Mount, Sha uh, Save Mount Diablo Public Land Trust there. So I was just out hiking near Mount Diablo uh, a week or so ago with him. We had a wonderful time. And Diablo is associated in particular uh, with a flood myth, very much like uh, the flood myth in the Bible, uh, in which the human race is, uh, in this case, recreated on the summit of Mount Diablo after a flood. And then when it goes down, the people come down. Um, uh, I got this from a, a very good friend of mine here in Berkeley, Malcolm Margolin, who's a real authority on uh, Native Americans, especially Native Californians, and started a publishing company, Heyday Books, uh, which focuses on a lot of this. Um, so yes, uh, the other sacred mountain close by here, of course, is Mount Tam as well. Great. Well, on that note, uh, on that sacred note, I want to encourage everyone to uh, go to your local bookstore uh, and purchase Sacred Mountains of the World and the Art of Pilgrimage. And also, yes, please visit uh, Heyday Books uh, for wonderful books on Native American culture and the California Institute of Community Art and Nature, which is also Malcolm's new organization. Yes. And also I want to encourage everyone, everyone, wherever you are, walk up to Telegraph Hill, uh, walk up to Indian Rock in Berkeley, get that high view, that panoramic view where you can feel at the center of your community uh, and the center of a world, both inside and out. And I want to thank um, Ed Birnbaum and also Phil Cosano for an inspiring evening together. And we look forward to seeing you in person soon.